was an interesting couple of years. Happy to talk to anybody about it online or if you want to message me absolutely. That was very interesting. Certainly interesting from a leader point of view because Venezuela is a male driven society. So for me to come in as the financial controller over and above Juan Carlos, who'd been in position before me and was naturally expected to be the, the successor for the role, was a problem to start with. And again, how you go about dealing with things in those situations, everything starts to take on a different look. But I went from there, I went to America with them, etc. And when I came back, I managed to get a job as finance director. Because that sort of experience had given me enough to finally be able to get a job as an FD. And I spent a long time as an FD, working through various companies and projects, sort of for projects, then divisions, and then companies, and I was an FD. And of course, for many, lots of people who are FDs have, have quite much to say as FDs, and there's certainly nothing wrong with it. FDs are often the assistant MDs or the assistants of the chief executive, the right hand man. They quite often got more power than the chief exec in certain ways within a business, which is always interesting, um, and it's fine. But I didn't want to stay there. I wanted to become a chief exec or a managing director. It make a difference from the American leaders now. Um, so I didn't want to stay in that position. And after a serious length of time, I finally got my chance where somebody had come to me, was interested in this role. And I picked this role for a lot of reasons. I picked this role because it wasn't a burning platform. So some people have said, you know, if you go to be an MD, one of the ideas is maybe take your first job or something at the bottom, because then the only way is to go up. But I didn't really want to do that. I wanted to take something that's kind of good, but could potentially be great. And the reason for that was through all those years of work and study, I've done a lot of continual learning and study. Through all those years, I wanted to take all of what I thought was the best that I'd seen and apply it within a company. You can't do that if you take on a burning platform. Burning platform requires you to be a Churchill leader. It requires you to go in, it requires you to dominate, it requires you to make those decisions and move that company to a different place. I didn't want to do that as my first role as an MD. I wanted to do the concept of good to great. So anybody who hasn't read the book, it's brilliant, read it. The concept of good to great. So I wanted to take a company that was okay or a little bit better than okay and I wanted to make it a great company. And I'm still on that journey with that business and all of the people in that business and that's been a bit of an ongoing thing for us. I've now been with them since July July the 4th, 2016, so coming up for 18 months. Um, and obviously, yeah, you know, I have had, um, it's a man's world, the railway industry, we're doing lots and lots of things to try to change that, it's helpful um, when you get a role like I get to be able to, to get out there and, and talk more about diversity and inclusion. But I also have a lot of hope that it's actually going to be less necessary as you all go through and graduate and change. I look at my son, who doesn't have those same issues, because he's watched me be the career person in our home all his life. He said, so no, you know, why would you differentiate between women and men? So, and that's great. And I, I, have a, I have a hope and an expectation that most of you sitting in this room will also be in that same place. Um, Though I still think, you know, aside from gender diversity, there's plenty of other things that we're going to need to overcome. And it is going to be down to everybody here to see what you can do about that as you go forward. So that was my, that was kind of my um, journey. <coughs> and so, so we talk about, we talk about that back in terms of leadership. Um, we talk about making an impact on somebody was the first thing I saw through Brian Ricketts. And then, and I just, we said, you know, think about your teachers, etc. And then when I started in my management position, um, I had lots of the traits, okay? So when I first started out in management, I had lots of the traits that were there in trade theory, like we talked about before. But it did make me a leader. And it was quite interesting back then, because when I started out on the management book, I wanted everything done my way. Now, of course, it was even worse, because I'd started off right at the bottom, so I knew how to do all these things. So I wanted everything done my way. Um, and I would try and be too specific. And it didn't make me either a good leader or a good manager. It made everything hard to deliver because actually if you want to be that specific, you almost might as well be doing it yourself. And you don't have time to do everything yourself. So when I first started out, I was trying to be too specific about everything. And I, and I didn't get people on side. I wasn't a great leader, and I say, I wasn't even necessarily a great manager. I still had all those traits though. Um, one of the things I did do is that I continued learning throughout. So when I eventually learned, I did eventually learn, 
that my way uh, is not necessarily the only way. My way might be right, but lots of things that you do in business and in your career, there is more than one way. Um, and it becomes a matter of letting go of your way and focusing on what the outcome is. What is it you want at the end? Not how do you get there, what is it that you want? And then let people figure out and deliver that for you, as opposed to being specific about how they deliver it. That's not engaging for people. That doesn't get people fired up. It doesn't get anybody to use their innovation, their imagination, their creativity. It doesn't do anything. It just means you'll do the same thing today that you did yesterday. Because that's how I did it yesterday. So if I tell you how to do it, that's how we're going to do it tomorrow. That's not going to lead to anything new. So the only way to lead to new things is to say, I like this. And then leave everybody else to figure out how, how they get to that for you. Because that's where you'll get new ideas. That's how you'll get to do things better than the last time. Not just the same thing all over again. So, things that. Continued learning. Remember as well, um, when I started, I used to treat everybody um, the way I wanted to be treated. <coughs> and every now and then it would bite me in the butt. And I go, I don't understand. I was really fair. There was nothing wrong with the way that I did that. That's how I want to be treated. And this is where learning and where emotional intelligence begins to come in. And there's no, you can be aware of emotional intelligence and you should all be aware of it. There's no real fast route to emotional intelligence. Some of it, um, it just comes through over time. But uh, having an awareness of it will naturally make you more emotionally intelligent. Because one of the most important things is that people don't want to be treated the way you want to be treated. People want to be treated the way they want to be treated. And the only way that you can understand that is if instead of looking at it from your point of view, you look at it from their point of view. Put yourself in their shoes, because you're not in yours, you're trying to put yourself in theirs. That's the beginnings of emotional intelligence. And if you do that, every decision you make will become more effective. But it took me, and I can stand here and tell you it, and some of you will always bear that in mind, and you'll carry on thinking it, and some of you won't, and you'll learn it exactly the same way I did, which is quite hard, but you'll get there eventually. Um, and am I there today? Well, you know what? Um, I'm still slightly domineering sometimes, and I'm still, um, despite being nervous today, overconfident in some situations, um, and I don't, you know, I don't have my intelli in, uh, emotional intelligence switched on every day. I don't. I wish I did. I wish I could say I did. But I don't. So you have to keep trying. You don't become a leader and that's it, you're a done deal. You just have to keep trying. Every day when you get out of bed, you try and switch on the right levers, leave the bad ones in bed, and go in and try and do the best you can. But it doesn't, it doesn't stop. It's not. I'm there. I'm good. We're all good. So, um, so, the other thing that I found as well, and it's one of the reasons I've got time to think about leadership, etc., is that the further I got up the ladder, the less specific my role became, basically. So when you lower down the, the, the ladder, you know, you go in and you've got this very specific <coughs> job to do, and it's fine, you understand what it is, and you do it. And as you go into management, you've, got, you've still got a specific job you have to do, and you've got some people to manage and so on. But it's all very, you can, you can control it, you can understand it, you can write it onto a piece of paper, someone says, what's your job, and write it down. As you move up the ladder from a seniority perspective, your role becomes less and less specific. And with that becomes lots of questions for yourself on, am I, you know, am I doing the right thing? Um, should I be doing something different? You do have time to think. It's what you're supposed to be doing. The more senior you get, the more you're supposed to be thinking it through, visioning the future, thinking about strategy. So you have time for it. But one of the things that brings is far more questioning of what are you doing? Are you doing it the right way? Um, and it is one of the things as you move to the ladder. So that's, that's another way that your emotional intelligence starts to develop because actually you get a little bit more time to think about stuff. Um, you can lose confidence. Interestingly, I became less confident in lots of ways as I got older, not more. Um, I, well, quite frankly, when I was you, I knew the answer. No doubt about it, absolutely knew the answer. Um, it was only as I began to get a little bit older that I began to think maybe I don't always know the answer. But that's good, you know, because that is part of being able to develop as a leader. Um, and so that gradual understanding. And the other thing was as well, in my business, and, and it is something that I do.